This is the start of TK Academy, which stands for Team Knowledge for Architects and Designers. Today is one of our core competency courses, which is just a return to the basics. And today's topic is accessibility. Here are the learning objectives for this course. I'm just going to go ahead and read these. After completing this course, you will be able to identify the differences between the two significant legislative acts governing accessible design in public buildings. Identify minimum clearance requirements in parking stall spaces, site access routes, and required signage. Identify minimum clearance requirements for vestibules and accessible routes. And identify minimum clearance requirements for restrooms, plumbing fixtures, and countertops. So how did all this begin? Uh, well, there's two important uh, pieces of legislation that uh, uh, made accessible design a requirement. Uh, before these acts, uh, people with disabilities were really at a disadvantage in uh, uh, buildings or public spaces. They had uh, no means of, of uh, moving up and down stairs. Uh, things were out of reach and it was just not at all accommodating. And so the first uh, act, legislative act that came into place was the Architectural Barriers Act or the ABA. And this is public law. This goes back to August 12th of 1968 of when it was uh, passed and signed into law. And what the, the act basically says is it requires all federal government buildings to be accessible to those with disabilities. The other act is the Americans with Disabilities Act, the A ADA which is probably more commonly known. Uh, this is public law. Again, this was enacted at the, uh, the federal level, and this was uh, put into place on July 26, 1990. The difference here between the ADA and the ABA, the ADA requires privately owned buildings with public accommodations to be accessible to those with disabilities. So this really affects uh, all buildings and, and the practice of architecture in general. Uh, any building that has public access, whether it's privately owned or, or not, uh, has to be designed to accommodate those with disabilities. The accessibility guidelines are really a building code. It's one that is enacted at the federal level. And uh, the United States Access Board has been formed and charged with the responsibility for developing and maintaining these standards. Again, there's two sets of standards that fall underneath here. The ABA standards, which applies to federal buildings. And there are four federal agencies that uh, are charged with development and, and maintaining these standards. The Department of Defense, Department of Housing and Urban Development, the General Services Administration, or GSA, and the U.S. Postal Service. The other set of standards, the ADA standards, which apply to privately owned buildings that have uh, provided service or provide public access. And the federal uh, agencies uh, uh, form this are Department of Justice and Department of Transportation. So if you go to the United States Access Board website, you see these two sets of standards. These uh, are essentially identical. They are, are the same. Um, there are very small nuances that, that separate uh, these from each other, mainly what type of uh, project uh, is being served. Now the International Code Council uh, has also decided to get in the game and they have published their uh, document, the A117.1, which is the standard for accessible and usable buildings and facilities. This document essentially just sums up what the, the um, requirements are of the ABA and, and the ADA. Uh, the reason why we have this is because uh, it is something that the local jurisdictions can uh, easily adapt as part of their code, even though it references uh, what is required by federal law and already developed in these other standards. So essentially all three of these things are uh, saying the same thing. Let's start looking at some of these standards. We're going to start at those that apply to the site and then work our way into uh, to the building. So the first... Uh, uh, item we're going to look at is the parking. The number of accessible parking spaces is uh, ultimately determined by the local ordinance or uh, the authority having jurisdiction. Uh, parking counts is usually a um, subject that is handled by uh, the planning department or uh, done by zoning ordinance. Uh, it's usually a requirement written into there. But if there is no local ordinance, then 
then the IBC has got you covered. Uh, the IBC lists the number of accessible parking spaces uh, that should be required. And it does so just based upon a ratio or this, this chart uh, that you see. So based upon the total number of parking spaces that are provided, then there are a uh, required minimum number of spaces that have to be accessible. Now that we have our count for the minimum number of required accessible uh, parking spaces, we're going to talk about some of the specific requirements uh, for each uh, space. So there are two, two spaces that you will come across, uh, one for cars uh, that has a minimum width of 96 inches and those for vans uh, which has a minimum width of 132 inches. Uh, most of the time you will see a requirement that uh, minimums uh, of one of your accessible spaces must uh, accommodate a van. In addition, every accessible parking space has to have access to, to an aisle. And uh, you'll see in this diagram, uh, what you'll commonly come across is two accessible spaces that are side by side. There's not necessarily an aisle that separates these two. However, each space does have direct access to an aisle adjacent to it. That aisle must connect uh, to an accessible route to the, the building's primary entrance. But you have a lot of times here is a six inch concrete curb uh, around the perimeter of the, the parking lot. And so you have to have this accessible ramp that connects the aisle uh, up to the accessible route and this accessible route is the minimum width here is uh, 60 inches that has to be maintained uh, all the way to the front entrance of the building. There's also a requirement for signage. Um, every accessible stall must have a sign indicating that it is uh, reserved for uh, accessible use. Signs, uh, these are typically pole signs, they, they do come in some different configurations but there's a, a minimum height requirement of 60 inches and again, that has to be centered on each parking space, um, each accessible parking space. What you'll also see a lot of times is that these uh, signs will be set back a minimum of, of 30 inches away from the curb. And that is because uh, most of the time when your vehicle, the vehicle, uh, the wheels will hit this front curb and it will overhang up to uh, 30 inches. And so these signs are set back to make sure that the, the bumper of the vehicle is not hitting, hitting those pole signs. There are other uh, requirements for uh, signs, the, the type of, the size of the sign, uh, the infographic, the colors, and so on. And uh, we'll discuss those later on in the presentation. Ramps are commonly used features to make a space compliant with the accessibility guidelines, but there are a lot of uh, requirements built into the use of ramps. So the most commonly known one is there, there's a maximum slope on ramps of 8% or 1 to 12, which means that there is one inch of rise or height uh, for every 12 inches of uh, horizontal distance. There's also a limit on, on the, the maximum height, uh, the rise on a ramp of 30 inches, which means you can't have a ramp that, that goes up uh, five feet. Uh, you can only go up to 30 inches, uh, then you have a landing. And if you need to continue to uh, move up, you, you'd have to have another ramp beyond that landing. There is also a minimum length uh, on a ramp. It has to be at least 60 inches. It can't be any shorter than that. Ramps that rise more than six inches must have a handrail on the side. And the uh, ramps are also required to have edge protection. So someone with like a, a seeing disability knows where the edge of the ramp is so they don't, don't trip or fall off of the ramp. Uh, there's three different ways to uh, accomplish this. One is to have a 12 inch floor extension uh, what that means is that the, the uh, level of the ramp uh, extends beyond the, the guardrail or whatever is defining the edge of that ramp. The floor ex extends out another 12 inches beyond. A uh, very commonly used method is to have a 4 inch high curb uh, that demarks the edge of the ramp. And another method is to have a, uh, a 4 inch high barrier. And what this means is that you'd have like a, a guardrail that is uh, uh, like four inches above the surface of the ramp. Uh, so the space between that rail and, and the surface of the ramp is, is four inches or less. You, you couldn't take a four inch sphere and, and push it through that uh, space. Ramps also require landings. You must have a landing on both sides, the, the top uh, and bottom of the ramp. 
the extension of that landing is a minimum of uh, 60 inches. And then uh, the width of that landing also has to be at least equal to the width of the ramp. So if your ramp is uh, uh, 48 inches wide, then the landings have to be a minimum of 48 inches wide as well. For curb ramps on an exterior condition where you transition from an uh, accessible route to a street crossing or parking lot, uh, those are required to have a detectable warning surface, which uh, is uh, indicated by these truncated domes that are, are uh, 0.2 inches high. Um, again, these are required wherever there is a uh, transition from uh, one walking surface to another, such as a pedestrian street crossing, uh, loading zone or into a, a parking lot. Uh, this uh, detectable warning surface must have a depth of at least 24 inches and it is, has to be installed perpendicular to the direction of travel. And it's uh, to be the, the full width of, of a ramp surface. Uh, so there, there's a couple images uh, here at the bottom of the page that show the different types of uh, curb ramps. Uh, one is just a directional approach uh, and you can see the hatched area for the detectable warning um, uh, surface. But you also have to have this if you have a, um, uh, a ramp that has, um, uh, can be approached from the side. Uh, so you see that the, there's more of a flare cut uh, on the side of the ramp here. The maximum slope for that is a, a 1 to 10. But you still have to have the detectable warning pavers uh, in this condition. And those are still installed on a per perpendicular to the primary uh, travel uh, direction of travel. The image above shows uh, one method. Uh, this is a, a, a tactile uh, surface that is uh, installed in, in the pavement. Another uh, commonly used method is actually a, like a brick paver uh, that has uh, these truncated domes installed on top of it and you, you just install that as like a paver pattern uh, and set into the, the concrete walk. Along your accessible route, uh, transitioning from the outside to the inside, uh, there's a good chance that you'll have a vestibule. And if so, there's some specific uh, guidance that, uh, some clearances that must be met within that vestibule. So uh, if you have a doorway that swings inward, uh, example would be like this, this uh, middle example, the door swings inward to the vestibule, you must maintain a minimum clearance of four feet in front of that door from when it's fully open. So you can see this door leaf is, whatever the, the width of this door leaf may be, when it's fully open, you have to have four feet clear before any other obstruction within that space. Uh, all vestibules must maintain for a turnaround space, a turning diameter, 60 inch uh, space uh, that someone in a wheelchair is able to uh, completely turn, uh, turn around and change directions. And since uh, uh, vestibules are usually transitioning from the outside to the inside. There's usually a door threshold. Maximum height of that door threshold is one half an inch. You're required to have accessible routes both interior and exterior building. On the exterior, the, the minimum is 48 inches clear on, on uh, accessible routes. On the inside of the building, uh, your minimum is only 36 inches clear, but there's a lot more exceptions and, and rules that come into play here. So there is permitted a temporary width reduction to 32 inches for as, as long as it's no more than 24 inches in length. Where this really comes into play is in your doorways. And so uh, you may be thinking, well, oh, I can do a 32 inch wide door and uh, that meets the accessibility requirements. No, that's not true because when a door, even when it's fully open, that width of the door uh, is projecting out into the door frame uh, just a little bit, it's usually about two inches or so. And so a 32 inch door is actually only gonna have a clear of about 30 inches. So that's non-compliant. That's why you typically see uh, your doorways in commercial buildings, uh, especially along accessible, uh, that have to be uh, accessible routes, uh, a doorway is going to be 36 inches wide. Make sure that when it's fully open, you, you don't reduce that to anything less than 32. Um, this next bullet here, maximum protrusion of 4 inches, uh, that's protrusion into your accessible route. Where this comes into play, let's use the example again for doors, if a doorway is swinging uh, outward into the space of an accessible route, that door leaf cannot protrude out into that, that hallway or corridor by any more than four inches. 
So a lot of times what you see is that uh, there's an alcove or pocketed area for that doorway. So when it fully opens, it's not uh, protruding out into the, uh, the accessible route at all. Uh, other applications that you'll see is uh, like drinking fountains, uh, which, which protrude out quite a ways. Uh, those are also set back in like an alcove area uh, or something so that they're not projecting out any more than four inches. So again, it's that 36 inch minimum clearance uh, you can have a protrusion of up to four inches, but then that means the minimum clear is 32 inches, and that can happen for no more than 24 inches along the length of that corridor. Also along your accessible route, uh, the change in elevation, uh, you are permitted to have up to a one quarter inch maximum change in elevation, so that usually accommodates for differences in floor materials such as a uh, uh, tile, uh, a tile a lot of times this can be up to um, three eighths of an inch uh, thick uh, next to a, a lesser uh, material such as a, a, a VCT or something. So uh, the maximum change is a quarter inch. However, you are able to go up to a half inch difference in elevation change for like a threshold or something as long as that, that threshold is beveled or, or tapered to allow that uh, ease of transition between uh, elevation changes. There is a vertical clearance uh, height requirement. Uh, minimum vertical clearance is 80 inches. You think this, this would be just basic common sense. You don't want anything hanging down more than 80 inches where somebody could hit their head on. Uh, but where this really comes into play, uh, you see it a lot with uh, open stairwells like you see in this, uh, this picture in this graphic. Obviously the, the height of the, the stair clearance decreases as it goes to the, the lower level and the area directly beneath that stairs, at some point it becomes uh, uh, hazardous or dangerous that someone could hit their head on it or, or something, uh, something else. So at 80 inches uh, vertical clearance, you need to provide a barrier uh, underneath the stairway to keep people from, from going into that space. This could be uh, a rail or some other type of barrier. Uh, the photo does a good job of showing a, a planter that uh, helps define that, that space uh, underneath the stairs. The minimum height of that has to be at least 27 inches. And that's, so again, that's 27 inches around the entire space uh, un until it reaches 80 inches and then, then the rest of the area can be open. There are numerous accessibility guidelines when it comes to doorways. Um, we're not gonna get into all these here. We're just gonna cover some of the, the big requirements. Uh, doorways must have a minimum clearance of 32 inches. And so as uh, we discussed earlier, that means um, a 32 inch wide door uh, does not comply. The reason is when that, that doorway is open, the thickness of the leaf uh, still projects out from the jam about two inches. And so uh, your minimum clearance is only 30 inches. That, that doesn't comply with the requirements. That's why typically you see uh, uh, accessible doorways uh, are 36 inches wide. When that leaf is open, projects out the thickness of the leaf projects out still about two inches. You end up with about 34 inches clear, and that does comply. There are numerous clearance requirements, uh, minimum clearance requirements uh, for doorways on both the side and the front, depending upon uh, your approach to that door and which way the door swings, uh, whether it is a uh, whether it swings inward or outward, and in, in a push-pull configuration, uh, whether you're approaching it from the front. Uh, from the side, from the hinge direction, and, and so on. So we're not going to cover all these here. Um, I'm just making you aware that there are very specific minimum clearance requirements uh, in front of a door depending upon uh, its configuration. Door hardware also has uh, very particular uh, and numerous requirements that we're not going to get into uh, the, the very specifics of all those. The main thing to take away from this is that uh, Door hardware must be easy to grasp without twisting. And so the, the traditional door knob uh, that you see on the bottom right corner with the, the red no through it, that's not permitted. Any type of twisting motion that you do with your forearm uh, is not uh, uh, part of the guideline. It needs to be uh, like this lever above it that is uh, very easy to grasp uh, and very easy to push down to disengage that latch and uh, open up the doorway. For drinking fountains, there's no less than two. Uh, there are, there's a higher one and then a, a lower one for 
someone who is uh, bound by a wheelchair. Um, so the height of these, uh, the standing height uh, is 43 inches max, and for the accessible height, uh, it's uh, 36 inches. The spout of the accessible drinking fountain must be uh, at least 15 inches away from the wall, and that is for the, the knee space of someone who is uh, in a wheelchair to be able to uh, maneuver underneath that and still be able to get close enough to uh, utilize the drinking fountain. Uh, as I alluded to earlier in the uh, discussion about accessible routes, uh, we can drinking fountains cannot project into an accessible route more than four inches, so you usually see these uh, set back in an, an alcove space. A lot within the accessibility guidelines applies to restrooms, and that is because every restroom that is available to the public must be accessible. Restrooms have to provide for a 60 inch diameter turning space so that once someone who is in a wheelchair uh, gets into the restroom they have ability to maneuver around and turn around and be able to also get back out of the restroom. A minimum of one type of each fixture must be accessible. So in women's usually it's just water closets, uh, at least one of those has to be accessible. In men's where you have uh, water closets and urinals. Uh, if you have both of those, then one of each uh, has to be uh, designed for uh, accessibility. When there are multiple toilet compartments and sinks provided, uh, such as like a, a stadium or convention center where it's a very large restroom facility with, with multiple fixtures in it, uh, the minimum requirement is that 5% of those fixtures uh, must be accessible. Looking at the specifics for the, those uh, accessible fixtures, uh, the differences uh, really are whether your uh, water closet is uh, wall hung or whether it's floor mounted. Um, a lot of these uh, dimensions are the same, but uh, the ones that are vary are, are dependent upon that factor, whether it's uh, wall hung or floor hung or floor mounted. Uh, on both situations, you have a minimum of, of 60 inches wide. But then the depth of that, um, if it's wall hung, it's, it's 56 inches. If it's floor mounted, uh, it requires an error of 3 inches at 59. I always like to just make them uh, 5 foot by 5 foot square. Just, it makes it a little bit more simple. But uh, if you're a little tight for space, uh, those are the minimum requirements. Um, what is, a lot of times is missed is that there is some clearance requirements in front of the door, uh, 42 inches uh, in front of the doorway to allow for some uh, maneuvering uh, space. The water closets themselves uh, must be at least 18 inches away from the adjoining wall and uh, 18 inches high from the, uh, that's the, the rim of the water closet to the, uh, the, the finished floor. And then uh, grab bars are required. Uh, there's now three that are uh, required in water closets. You have the, the 36 uh, inch long one that's directly behind the water closet and then on the wall adjacent to it there are two. There's one that is a 42 inch horizontal and then an 18 inch uh, bar that is installed vertically. For lavatories and sinks there's a maximum height uh, requirement of 34 inches and then uh, a minimum uh, clearance um, side to side of, of 15 inches. Uh, so it's measured from the center line of the, the sink or lavatory uh, both directions to an adjacent wall or uh, even could be a, a adjacent uh, casework. Uh, the big requirement uh, to keep in mind here is the knee and toe clearances uh, beneath the sink. And so, uh, they need to have, uh, we need to provide that so someone who is in a wheelchair is able to maneuver and get close enough that they can still reach the, the, uh, the water spigot and the, the controls to turn that off and on and off. So the two configurations here, the, the one on the left uh, where it's, um, the sink is fully built in into some uh, casework. Uh, you can see the, the minimum requirements, uh, space requirements uh, that are provided there. And, and just a good thing to remember is that if it is fully enclosed, you still need to provide a, a removable panel or, or some means to, for maintenance to be able to go in there and, and do repair work uh, on the drain line. On the right side, uh, this is an open configuration. And this would be the same as if it was a, a wall hung lavatory. Uh, it's open below, so there's plenty of clearance for uh, knee and toes. Uh, but uh, what you need to really keep in mind here is the the drain line uh, has to be uh, has to have a shield or be wrapped to have some type of protection uh, from uh, hot water that may be draining through there, 
making the surface hot or if it's got sharp barbs or, or surfaces on there that uh, uh, someone in a wheelchair could uh, um, be exposed to that. So we need to cover that and make sure that they are, are protected. You're not always required to have accessible showers, but uh, when you do, there are some specific requirements that it must meet. Uh, there must be a fold-down shower seat, and uh, these must be able to, to fold back up uh, uh, vertically against the wall and, and create some more space uh, for maneuverability. The shower threshold, uh, the maximum height of that is one half inch, and this presents probably the biggest challenge uh, to designers, is to meet that uh, maximum requirement of a half inch and still be able to provide adequate drainage uh, so that there's no uh, overspill from the, the water uh, drainage onto the floor or overspray from the shower head that gets onto the uh, adjacent floor surface. Uh, there are requirements for grab bars within the shower compartment just, uh, just like with uh, toilet compartments. Uh, so there are both horizontal and vertical bar requirements. On the, the horizontal bars, they are required to be mounted uh, on the same wall as the shower head and controls, and then on the adjacent uh, wall, it must return back a distance of 18 inches. What you see in this uh, arrangement is that it, this is actually one continuous bar. Uh, there are not two separate bars. This is pretty common to, um, to have a continuous bar installed on the, the two shower walls. On this example on the bottom, uh, a little bit more difficult to see. You can see this horizontal bar um, again on the wall with the, the controls and shower head. What you don't see here is on the return wall, the, the 18 inches, it's, you can just see a little edge of it uh, right protruding out right there. Uh, there's also a requirement for uh, vertical bars and uh, very easy to see on this type of example. This must be mounted four inches in from the, the edge of the shower, which is easier to see on, on this bottom example, which actually has two, two bars, uh, vertical bars installed. You can see very clearly here that it's uh, mounted in, four inches in from the shower edge wall. The accessibility guidelines have uh, provide for two different shower configurations. The first one is what's called a transfer shower type, where someone from a wheelchair uh, physically lifts themselves from the wheelchair into the, the shower and um, to the seat. The minimum size requirement on this is 36 inches by 36, which is a pretty constricted, uh, a pretty tight location. And so there are uh, some clearance requirements on the outside uh, are a little bit larger. Uh, again, it's 36 inches deep, but now the requirement is 52 inches uh, long. So there is some overlap, 16 inches overlap um, along the, the wall that is required for the, the clearance space. Um, so you cannot have your wall protruding out uh, like it does on this side. This doesn't have the, the clearance requirement, but uh, along the, the wall that's parallel, uh, you can pick up that extra 16 inches. And so that this, uh, this wall must be uh, at least in line with the edge of the shower to meet that requirement. The other configuration we have is what's called a roll-in shower. This is a little bit narrow, it's only 30 inches depth, but it is 60 inches long. And there is a outside clearance requirement of the same dimensions, 30 by 60. And the idea here is that someone who is in a, a wheelchair is able to uh, physically roll their, their wheelchair into the shower and uh, uh, take a shower that way rather than having to lift themselves from uh, the wheelchair uh, into the shower and onto the seat. So for cabinetry or other uh, working surfaces, there are maximum height requirements. If it is a uh, what we call a standing height, uh, maximum height of that is uh, 34 inches. So someone who is uh, bound by a wheelchair can, can still use that uh, surface. If it's a sitting height, uh, such as like a workstation or desk, then the maximum height of that is 30 inches. And just like before with the, the uh, sinks and lavatories, the keep in mind there is knee and toe clearance requirements uh, below that working surface. Uh, and uh, one that is commonly missed here is that the, the bottom of any wall cabinet must be no more than 48 inches high. The requirements for interior signage really apply for those with uh, seeing disabilities. And so interior signs must have both raised characters and braille. And what is meant by raised characters, uh, for example, on this photo to the left, uh, stair 9000, 
uh, those uh, characters would be raised from the surface so someone uh, with a seeing disability could place their hands on there and, and feel uh, those letters being that are raised up from the rest of the surface. And then right below that uh, is, is uh, Braille. The maximum height of signage is 60 inches measured to the, to the baseline or the floor to the highest raised character. And so uh, that can be a little confusing. Uh, so what I see a lot of times is that the, the 60 uh, inch measurement is to the center line of the sign and then all the, the raised characters are uh, placed on the lower part of the sign to make sure that uh, they're in compliance with that specific requirement. Door signs must be installed on the uh, latch side uh, within 18 inches of that uh, latch. Uh, so you cannot put the sign on the, the hinge side. Uh, it must be on, on the latch side. Uh, so someone who uh, with a seeing disability can uh, find the sign and then uh, very quickly be able to navigate down to the, uh, to the door hardware and be able to uh, open that door. And that completes our topic today of accessibility. Thank you for participating in TK Academy.